Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. We are going to be reading John, Book of John again, chapter 7, 53, verses 8 through 11. Then each, each of them went home, while Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning, he came again to the temple. All the people came. I bet. All the people came to him, and he sat down and began to teach them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery and making her stand all, all before all of them. They said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in the very act of committing adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? They said this to test him, so that they might have some charge to bring him, to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. Then they kept on questioning him. He straightened, straightened up and said to them, let anyone among you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at him. And once again, he bent down and wrote on the ground. When they heard it, they went away, one by one, beginning with the elders. And Jesus was left alone with the women standing before him. Jesus straightened up and said to her, Woman, where are they? But has, has no one condemned you? She said, No one, sir. And Jesus said, Neither do I commend you condemn you. Go away and from now on do not sin again. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Let us continue in prayer. Lord God, we just ask that you be with us this morning. Help us to hear the words of the scripture to understand what they mean. Help us, Lord, to know your love and your grace within our lives. Help us to live lives that are worthy of the love and the grace that we have been offered. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We've been studying the Gospel of John, and uh, the Gospel of John is all about life. Where do you find life? Where do you find true life? Where can that abundant life be found? And, and you know, and I think most of us want a fulfilling life. We want a life that we feel good about. We want a life that, that, that is meaningful and, 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 and we can say, yeah, this life is good. This is what we all want. So in the study, we look at chapter 2. I'm just going to do a, a quick review of what we have been studying so far. In chapter view, there we see a, a, a chapter 2, we have a wedding banquet. A wedding banquet that is saved from failure when it runs out of wine. And we learn the truth here behind Mary's words when she says, go and do whatever Jesus tells you to do. And when the servants followed Mary's instructions and Jesus' instructions, the water was not only turned into wine, but, but we begin to understand what Jesus is doing. Jesus here is, is, is bringing a great banquet, a banquet that is foreshadowing the banquet of the coming of the kingdom of God that will come when we do whatever Jesus tells us to do. 
In chapter 3, we learn from Jesus' conversation that, that life is so much more than, than what meets the eye, that there is a spiritual reality that undergirds all of life, uh, uh, that a spiritual reality that is there underneath all of our material and physical world. And if you really want to see the kingdom of God, if you really want to experience life in, in the fullest, then you must be born from above. You must be born into this kingdom. In chapter 4, we learn more from uh, this, of this spiritual life in Jesus' conversation with the woman at the well. We learn that, that life in the Spirit can be moved, it can, can be compared to living water, an ever flowing stream of life. And when we drink of this water, that Spirit is going to satisfy the deepest thirst of our soul. There is a spiritual life that is rushing and flowing through this world if we just tap into that. Our, our thirst for life will be quenched. In chapter 5, we learn from Jesus that we cannot just sit and wait for God to stir the healing waters if we want life. God not only requires our trust, but God requires our effort. You know, we, t again, have to do what Mary teaches in chapter 2. She tells the servants to do whatever he tells you. And in one way or another, I believe we are all like that man beside the pool. If we want healing, if we want wholeness, if we want abundant life, then we must do what Jesus tells us to do and get up and walk. There is an undergirding reality, a spiritual reality to life that's every bit as real as the physical world that we live in. In fact, Jesus is telling us that we will never have true life until we're born of this reality. And the reality of God's kingdom, a reality that Unfortunately, we don't see a whole lot of in this material world is love and grace and mercy and forgiveness. God's love is unfathomable. God's love is beyond comprehension. God's love is perfect beyond perfection. And God's kingdom is like a great banquet where everyone has been invited to and everyone gets to feast on what is best in life. God is inviting us all to this feast, a feast where the Spirit quenches the deepest thirst of our lives. God is inviting us to, to a place where love and grace and mercy and forgiveness are our destiny. We have been invited into a deeply spiritual reality, a, a, a reality that is connected to and can have direct influence on our lives in the world. When we follow Jesus' instructions to drink of the living waters, when we follow his instruction to get up and to walk, we experience healing. We experience wholeness. We experience an abundant life unlike anything else can offer. God's grace, God's love, God's mercy and forgiveness, though, cannot be bought. When we fail to share God's love, grace, and mercy, we demonstrate that we don't have it. You know, the abundant life of God must be shared in order to possess. You can't give away what you don't have. And if you don't give it away, 
you will never possess it. And this is the mystery of our faith. We're sinners. We are sinners who have strayed so far from our created purpose and our destiny that the only way we can love the way Christ loves is to take a leap of faith and to plop ourselves right in the middle of the flowing waters of the Holy Spirit. We've got to drink deep. We have to immerse ourselves in the Holy Spirit until God's presence is running through our veins and is we're oozing out love. Not our love, because our love is limited, but God's love, because God's love is limitless. Way back in chapter 2 of the Gospel of John, Jesus is getting upset because the, the Jews are trying to, to, to buy and sell this love and grace and mercy by sacrificing animals on the altar of God. But as I said earlier, God's love cannot be bought. God loves us, period. That's just the way it is. He loves us, yes, Billy, all the time. You know. However, it's very easy to live outside the blessings of God's love. It's very easy to live solely and completely in this world without any bit of awareness of God's world, of, of, of the abundance of life that is available in the kingdom. In the material world, if I do something nice for you, I have a chance that I might influence you to do something nice for me. But this is not so with God. God's love cannot be bought. God loves us. God loves us. God loves you, and there's nothing you can do about it. Entrance. Entrance into the spiritual reality, this ever-flowing stream of, of God's love and life, cannot be bought by money or sacrifice. So Jesus, acting like a prophet, enters the temple, makes a cord, uh, uh, makes a whip out of some cords, and drives out the animals that were there to be sacrificed. And this happens way back in the beginning of, of the Gospel of John. And he turns over the money changers' tables. Now, he's making a point here, making a point here, that you cannot buy God's favor. You just can't buy it. Jesus, by this action, is not making any friends with the authorities. He's not making any friends with the Pharisees and the scribes and the uh, political leaders of his day. But Jesus wants us to know that we can receive God's grace we can receive God's mercy. We can receive God's forgiveness in a much simpler way than the formality and ritual of the temple. It's as simple as accepting it and living it. We must accept it and live it in order to have it. In Matthew's Gospel, Jesus quotes the prophet Hosea when the Pharisees get upset because he's eating a meal with the tax collectors and the sinners. And so he tells the Pharisees, go and learn what this means. God desires mercy, not sacrifice. The entire passage from Hosea reads, for I desire mercy, not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. So now, the scribes, the Pharisees, the religious leaders, they're out to get Jesus. 
You know, all this teaching about God's love and grace and mercy being freely offered is undercutting their system of sacrifice for sin. When the law is broken, our relationship with God is breached, and we must atone for our mistakes. But performing a ritual in the material world does not guarantee that a spiritual change is actually going to take place. It's too easy to perform a ritual without any spiritual change really happening in our life. You know, it's, we all know of these, uh, well, the scripture even talks about it in many, many different places. You know, you go through all of these rituals, but that's not what I want. That's not what I want, says God. He wants us to love one another. He wants us to get our act together. You know, to begin to, to, to see that His love is in how we treat one another and, and take care of ourselves. Jesus is contradicting the very basis on which that society has been built upon when they have built it upon this atoning for our sins through the sacrifice. Jesus is a dangerous guy to them. So the religious and political leaders begin to find a way to trap Jesus. And uh, this is what today's scripture is about. You know, uh, Jesus it, it, it is in the same world but he really sees this world very differently than the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the scribes. Everything Jesus teaches, every action he takes is based on the reality that the kingdom of God is a kingdom of abundance, a kingdom of grace, a kingdom where fear is non-existent because love, the love of God, is assured. The Pharisees and religious leaders are afraid of losing control of the society if Jesus' teachings catch on. So they're looking to find a way to discredit Jesus. They bring forward this woman who is caught in adultery. And let me say that this whole episode, you can tell just by reading it, they're not interested in trying to enforce the law of Moses. They're not really interested in what is right according to the law of Moses. They're about trying to trap Jesus. And that's evident from the beginning because the scripture says she was caught in the very act of adultery. That means they know who the man was too. That means that they only, but that we see that they only brought her forward, not the man. You know, Yet the law clearly states in Leviticus 20.10, if a man commits adultery with another man's wife, both the adulterer and the adulteress are to be put to death. Both the man and the woman are to be punished by their, for their actions. So again, they are not interested in upholding the Mosaic Law. They're just trying to catch Jesus. And they're trying to do this in a way that if they can get Jesus to pronounce the forgiveness that they know Jesus is doing because that's what he's been teaching, love and grace and forgiveness. If they can get Jesus to, 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 to say that this woman is forgiven for what she has done, and, and that it doesn't matter, and to, to, to let her go, they can claim that Jesus is not following the Mosaic Law. They can claim that Jesus is a heretic. He's not doing what our faith tells us to do. On the other hand, if they get Jesus to say, yeah, go ahead and stone her, that's what the law says, do it, well, then they've trapped Jesus on the other side because Roman law forbids anyone 
to condemn anybody to death except the Roman governors. They are the only ones who have that power. So they're trying to get Jesus either to break the Mosaic law or to break the Roman law. And they figure if they get into, you know, they'll have him trapped. If whatever he does, then he's got no escape. They'll get him one way or another. But Jesus is a smart guy. Jesus then kneels down and starts riding in the dirt, perhaps time to give himself uh, time to think, to hear, figure out what he wants to say. Jesus, I'm sure, was probably thinking back over the scriptures and is aware that there are so many places in the scripture where it says that there is not a righteous person on earth who always does what is right and never sins. So Jesus responds with this instruction. If any one of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone. Jesus found a way to manifest God's love, grace, mercy, and forgiveness without contradicting the Mosaic Law. Remember, Jesus said that do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets, but I have uh, come, I have come not to abolish them, but to fulfill them. So Jesus now straightens up and asks the woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. Or as other translations say, go now and sin no more. Remember when Jesus healed the man at the side of the pool? He encounters this man later in the temple. And he says to the man, Hey, look here, you're well again. Stop sinning or something worse might happen to you. Jesus is not trying to do away with the law. We are to stop sinning. But God's love and God's grace, it's not a free pass. It's not a free pass to sin any way you want to. We are still required to get our act together. But realize that we are now empowered. Empowered when we drink of that water of everlasting life. Empowered by God to live this life that He is calling us to. Yes. God requires our faith. God's going to move and make things happen for us. But we have to put our effort into it as well. We can't just pray, Lord, I want a job. Or Lord, I want to get off the streets. We have to also, we have to trust that God loves us and that God's got a plan for us. But we have to also put our effort into it. We have to put our effort into it, and then God will multiply that effort a hundred times if we have that faith. Jesus is not trying to say that we get a free ride. To do away with the law. He's not trying to say that there are no consequences to our sin. There are. But Jesus is committed to more than the requirements of the law. Jesus is committed to the care and the transformation of every one of us. The woman in the story and every one of us. He wants us 
to live a transformed life, a sanctified life, a holy life, and He is the power to make that happen. Throughout the New Testament, we encounter amazing stories of God's love and grace and mercy. A love and grace and mercy that confronts our tendency towards self-righteousness and judgment. That's not what God wants. God wants our transformation. So this is what I leave. I leave this question with you. What does it mean for us not to throw stones and to encourage one another instead to go and sin no more?